Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. So when bears get to the hair traps, they either have to go over or under the barbed wire as they pass, hopefully leave hair on the wires. This is a young common snapping turtle. He's probably about five years old. This species can reach up to 45 pounds. It's got good water, we find fish in it, and that's a very good indicator that you've got water flowing year round. All these things behind me are not mountains. They're the edge of the rim of the canyon. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. The black bear is making a return to East Texas, an animal that was almost wiped out due to unregulated hunting and loss of habitat is slowly making its way back to the bottomland forests along the state's eastern border. The bears are coming. The adjoining states of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana have a growing, expanding bear population, and they're spilling over into East Texas and will continue to do so. It's a pretty nice looking bottomland through here. So now, a team from Stephen F. Austin State University is looking for black bears. We really have uh, limited information about how many bears we have in Texas and where they are. Yeah, this looks like really good habitat. The only information we've had up until this study was uh, sightings information where the Texas Parks and Wildlife would track uh, documented sightings where people had seen bears and they report them. He comes through generally April and May. More and more East Texans are seeing black bears. So we should be able to get a picture of him. Landowners' remote cameras provide the proof that bears are here. Now this shows the bear laying. He's really controlling the corn that I have. Yeah, it almost out. looks like that's early morning and he fell asleep in that corn pile to me. Parks and Wildlife started keeping data on black bear sightings in East Texas about 1978. Since that time, we've had about 120, give or take, black bear sightings, and probably 80% or more of those have been in the last 10 to 20 years. Right now, we're gonna go up into this area. Graduate student Dan Kaminsky yeah, like goes go over the search area this for this massive bear study. I wanna get in there and put in this site today. Dan and his team will spend three years searching the Natchez and Sabine River basins of southeast Texas. Hey, this area's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's actually uh, right up here. We're primarily interested in large, contiguous, undeveloped habitats, uh, large chunks of forest. We might be able to find a good spot up here. We're kind of focusing in on areas where we've had a lot of historic sightings of black bears over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. To identify possible bears, the team is using barbed wire as part of a new DNA sampling technique. I'll hold it. It's called a hair snare trap. A hair snare trap is an array of barbed wire strung around three or four trees. Down a little bit. And an animal actually has to cross through the barbed wire to get to the bait, hopefully leaving uh, hair samples on the barbs. That looks good. And the bait of choice? It's USDA Prime cow blood. That's a ripe one. Uh, the lure we use is a three to one mixture of cattle, uh, cattle blood and fish oil. Uh, we let it age for about four months and then uh, bottle it up into individual one liter bottles. 100% guaranteed maggot free. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The idea is you want something that really smells a lot. It's going to project an odor over a long distance. Okay. There you go. Perfect. And for dessert, 
cherry pie filling. We're also trying to appeal to their, their sweet tooth, essentially. No matter what kind of, what their preference is, they're gonna find something that wants to bring them in here. Well, I think that spot might turn out pretty well. Hopefully we'll get something. I mean, we should be able to get a lot of hair samples in this bottom land anyway. In Montana, researchers have mounted remote video cameras to study grizzly and black bears using the same hair snare traps. So when bears get to the hair traps, they either have to go over or under the barbed wire uh, and as they pass, hopefully leave hair on the wires. And some of the bears, when they come into these piles, they'll roll in the blood and, and it's just kind of, uh, you know, kind of like a dog would roll in a dead animal. Bear rubs are also good spots to capture not only bear behavior, but bear DNA as well. So as bears travel through their home range, they'll use these natural rub objects as an indication to other bears to say, hey, I'm in this area. And so what the researchers in Montana have done is that they've actually put barbed wire on these natural rub objects so when bears rub on them, they can collect genetic material through the hair, through the hair follicle for uh, DNA testing. Back in the forests of East Texas, Dan's team continues to check the snare sites, and they're finding some hair. So, how's it look? I think this one's a hog looking at the medulla. Dan has hundreds of samples to analyze. Based on the cuticular structure or the scaling on the hair, uh, I can use this dichotomous key to help identify if we have a raccoon or a hog or even a bear hair sample here. Is hog what you see mostly? It's been primarily hog and raccoon. Intense logging of bottomland hardwood forests in the late 1800s wiped out most of the black bear habitat in Texas. There has been a great loss, and reclamation is, is a, uh, a mechanism to, to regain what we once had. J.W. Smith lives up along the Texas-Oklahoma border and has seen black bears on his property. And the pecan crops, what brought the bear into here? Yeah, I would assume. It's... He's working with Texas Parks and Wildlife to restore some of the savannas. Bottomland hardwood forest habitat that used to be here. Eastern red cedar, though it's native, it's really taken over. So, in order to restore that diverse forest savanna that should be here, first of all, you have to remove those cedars so that those other things can return. So, you basically go from 500 to 600 acres of poor habitat. Yeah, to a quality to, habitat. Yeah, it's a fantastic habitat. Yeah, this recovers and does well. We're right now in Pecan Bayou in northeast Texas. Pecan Bayou runs parallel to the Red River, and it's a high-quality habitat corridor. So any habitat work being done adjacent to this provides connectivity for these bears to, to move through these corridors. Maybe we can set it as an example. I guess I really am glad to see that the bears are coming back, and I hope that what we do in conservation and, and habitat restoration will, will help that. It's been three years now, and Dan's team has covered thousands and thousands of acres. The most important part right now is just making sure that we get all the hair collected before we do anything else. The hair snare team found hundreds and hundreds of samples. When I come across these hair samples that I'm not sure what they are, it's usually because they're under fur. It turns out no samples proved to be bear hair. But one thing Dan's learned on this study, the habitat is here and the black bear is coming back to these remote parts of East Texas. If we don't have bears here in East Texas right now, that's okay, uh, but we know that the habitat exists for them. Uh, it's just a matter of time before they actually do establish a, a, a self-sustaining breeding population.
we know that this is going to take a while and if we will just give them a chance and try and learn to live with them and not harm them, I think people will be pleasantly surprised at the opportunity to see them and to live with them again in the forests of East Texas. Hi, I'm Andy Glusenkamp, state herpetologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife, and today I'm going to talk about turtles and roads. This is a young common snapping turtle. He's probably about five years old. This species can reach up to 45 pounds. That seems really large until you compare it to our other native snapping turtle. The threatened alligator snapping turtle can reach almost four times that size. So, what should you do if you find a turtle in the road? My advice is, if conditions allow and it's safe to do so, move the turtle in the direction it was going, but don't do anything that would put you or the turtle at risk. Texas has incredible diversity of freshwater turtles, from red-eared sliders to soft shells to the diamondback terrapin. You may find female turtles crossing the road, either going to or coming from laying eggs. Or later in the season, you may find hatchlings crossing the road, returning to water. So I hope I've helped answer that question of, why did the turtle cross the road? If you've driven across the Texas Panhandle, it's like basically driving on the world's largest billiard table. Everything is flat. And then we get to Paladura Canyon and the bottom just drops out of it. Whenever you see it, it's just, it makes an impact. I saw it myself 12 years ago for the first time and it just floored me. All these things behind me, are not mountains, they're the edge of the rim of the canyon. We're 800 feet below the level of the ground. When you come into the park, Look. you see something? Yeah. A wood house. All you see is grassland, farmland. See, if you come right here. And they just can't believe that this is here. And when you start down to the bottom of it, it's just awesome. When you come over here, you kind of have a good view. Whoa, there's wood. That's where the Civilian Conservation Corps came in here to build the uh, buildings, to make the roads. And what was so interesting about that, where the CCC units camped, that was a tent city down there. It's amazing, especially the, the caves. Uh, when I do bus tours, I can hear people in the back going, oh my, look at that. So they're always real surprised because this just opens up. The canyon system itself is over 120 miles long and over 20 miles wide. The canyon has been sacred to mankind ever since they started living here 12,000 years ago. They considered it have magic powers. They, the Comanche Nation still holds it as a sacred place. But we're the second largest canyon in the country. The Grand Canyon is nice to stand on the edge and go, that's a great canyon. Here, you can get into the canyon and you can become part of it. You're surrounded by the canyon and you can go, I'm the only person on earth right now because you know, there's nothing around me. Oh, it's great. It's about 25 miles from Amarillo. It's the second largest canyon in the United States. You've got the scenery, you're outdoors, lots of wildlife, and it's just beautiful down here. This is just such a beautiful place. I was asked one time, how do you feel when you're in here? And I said, there are days when you're just kind of down, you think, oh man, and you come in, I just take a drive. I drive through the canyon, and I said, it just lifts my spirit. You know, you look at this beautiful thing that's here, how can you not feel better after seeing that?
nobody knows how many springs exist in Texas. Basic information on most springs just doesn't exist, but that is changing, one spring at a time. pH 7.40, specific conductance 486. Well, the purpose or objective of our study is primarily to gather some baseline information on springs. Um, this includes the location, the, the biotic community, what, what we find there, that being the fish and bugs and salamanders, plants. And we're getting some water samples as well as discharge of the springs. This is an acoustic Doppler current profiler and for 40 seconds it will measure the velocity. And then we do it a minimum of 20 times across a stream. Currently in the state, there's not a lot of information on springs with the exception of the major springs that we have in the state. San Marcos, Comal, Barton Springs. There's a good amount of data collected on those, but many of the smaller springs, especially as you head further out west that feed some of those major rivers, there just hasn't been much data collected on those, primarily because the majority of them are on private property. Such springs play an increasingly important role as climate patterns fluctuate. Springs provide the base flows to our rivers and streams and creeks during dry times. They are what keep them flowing when there is no rainfall. So for instance, during this last year, 2006, we had a relatively dry year and it was a, a pretty good drought. M many of our creeks and rivers would not have had water in them if it wasn't for the springs that feed them. So they are sustaining in-stream, riparian and aquatic habitats all the way down to the mouth of the bays and estuaries. I've heard estimates that the, the flow from Comal and San Marcos Springs, they can account for as much as 70 to 80 percent of the flow of the Guadalupe at its mouth during times of drought. So while these springs are exceptional in size and not all springs are this large, the accumulation of many smaller springs in a river basin, it supports that entire length of the river during these dry times and they're very important. A stable spring provides a very productive habitat certain plants and animals found there can reveal the condition of the spring. The purpose of collecting the fish and the insects, what biota we find there can tell us something about the health of that aquatic ecosystem. So uh, there's sort of a scoring system based upon what you find there that can tell us whether or not it's healthy or degraded. As degradation or impacts to an aquatic ecosystem rise, generally you'll have less diversity. So the more diversity we find in an ecosystem, that tells us something about the health of it. This is a good, healthy spring that flows year round. It's got good water, we find fish in it, and that's a very good indicator that you've got water flowing year round. Good, healthy, clean water. He's right, oh, you see him, he's wiggling around, he just yep, shot there up there. He, there he went. One group in particular that we find generally in abundance in the springs is the caddisflies or the trichopterans. They're a group that's largely recognized as being a good indicators. Caddisflies could be divided into two categories. There's free living and case making caddisflies. Certain species will use sticks and smaller pieces of leaves or use sand grains or small gravel and their cases are in various shapes and sizes. What you can see here is some tree leaves. He's come in and cut a little hole, and then that's what he made his little house out of. You can see that it's a little round thing on top, one on top of another. He spins that together, and then he lives inside of his case. Some insects you'll find around almost any body of water are dragonflies and damselflies. They are not necessarily a, an indicator of aquatic ecosystem health, but they are quite common in the springs and there's a very diverse number of these organisms that we find in the springs. And because many of the springs are very remote and they may be the only water supply around for miles in many cases, they often harbor unique species which adds some body of knowledge to the distribution and range of these critters.
We collect, measure, and enumerate the specimens we see in the field. We only keep a few voucher specimens to bring back to the lab to verify our ID. This one belongs to the family less today. I can tell that right off the bat. In the lab, I was examining some damselflies and damselfly larvae. We were looking at its labium, which is basically its, its lower lip, and more specifically, we're looking at its palpal hooks. That's one of the ways we ID the guys. You have to open up their mouth, and you're looking for the number of hairs on the inside of their lower lip. It can be that minute of a detail that you look for to identify these guys. Most of this research would not be possible without the help of private landowners. The cooperation of private landowners is absolutely essential to our project. You know, 95% of the state, I believe, is privately owned, and so that includes the vast majority of springs in the state. In the past, some landowners feared that endangered species might be found, but that is changing. Typically, these landowners have that endangered species on their land because they've done the right things. Having that endangered species on their land gives them another level of protection. They've got federal law behind them protecting that species and the habitat they live on. Obviously, the habitat's compatible with the way of life of that farmer or rancher because that's what they've been doing all this time. We actually had people that said, you don't want to bring those, those guys out here. If they find an endangered species, you won't be able to do anything with your land. And my wife and I actually looked at each other and thought, how perfect would that be? There are some changes to what you can and can't do, uh, or at least potentially there are, to what can and can't be done if endangered species are dependent upon the, on your land. That's, to some people, maybe a problem. They couldn't necessarily bulldoze it and put a subdivision on it. But to others, they think that's just great. That preserves that land and preserves the quality of that habitat that's, that's available and, and there for all of our future. We've loved Chad and the guys coming out doing all the measurements, and we welcome it. I feel very fortunate just to have access to get to go see many of these springs. So each time, it's like I, I just wonder what I'm going to find. See? But th these guys are an indicator of good water quality. If you, find, yeah, right. if you find these somewhere, then you can be pretty sure your water's not, not too bad. <laughs> if we're not working with these landowners and, and helping them appreciate these resources and conserve these resources, then we're not doing our job to help protect these springs. Texas is a big state, and we need your help protecting it. If you see someone messing with Texas wildlife, contact our toll-free Operation Game Thief hotline. It's Crime Stoppers for Critters, manned around the clock, and you could receive up to a $1,000 reward. Thousands of Texans have helped Operation Game Thief put a stop to wildlife abuse. You can make a difference.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.